first speaker today in Tongan. He's professor in legal philosophy at the University of Oxford. Prior to me, he has been visiting professor at the universities of Columbia, Yale, Texas, Princeton, and the Australian National University. Some of his main publications there are several for the whole paper is uh, the famous uh, uh, vault pass uh, that's recorded by Jules himself um, in, uh, in Risks and Wrongs on the subject of how to understand uh, the, the nature of corrective justice as it applies, as it's understood for the purposes of analyzing tort law. And uh, up to Risks and Wrongs, Jules had famously espoused uh, a theory of corrective justice or the kind of corrective justice known as the annulment conception. And according to the annulment conception, corrective justice is done to the extent that wrongful losses and wrongful gains are neutralized or annulled. And as he points out in Risks and Wrongs, it didn't really matter to the annulment conception how the neutralization or annulment of the gains and losses was achieved. So this was uh, in this Jules, uh, during the writing of Risks and Wrongs, um, came to regard that uh, annulment conception as, as defective, and uh, several people influenced uh, his change of view on that, but probably most conspicuously Stephen Eric, who presented comments on some draft material from Risks and Wrongs. Um, and um, the objections, uh, Perry's objections, the objections of others around the same time, led uh, Jules to contemplate, without endorsing, a rival explanation or conception of corrective justice, which in risks and wrongs is described as the relational conception. And according to the relational conception, if the wrong not the loss, it must be annulled, step one. If relational conception claims 
claims in effect that corrective justice operates on the relationship between person and set in future, I put wrong, that's not true, but relationships. And it does so in the following way. If one person has wronged another, then corrective justice imposes a duty on the wrongdoer to rectify his wrong. So that's the summary statement, from risks and wrong, of the, uh, of the relational conception. Uh, and Jules didn't end up embracing that, as I say. He, he did think that there was something to be said for it. And uh, he felt, and risks and wrongs enunciated, the view that um, some features of the annulment two reasons. Um, he says the annulment view has two general problems that are related. First, he says it seems unable to account for the distinction between restorative and corrective justice. And second, it provides only grounds for recovery, whereas a proper conception of corrective justice will specify a mode of rectification as well as a reason for doing it. Rectification of corrective justice will be the duty of someone in particular. So this is the passage where Jules <coughs> explains why he is changing his mind about the structure or nature of corrective justice. So in, in the written version of this paper, I devote two main sections respectively to these two main reasons for abandoning the annulment conception. Uh, as I say, the first one, the first section, site appear to be reanalyzable, reanalyzable only in one of the models, it's going to be reanalyzable in either. And in doing that, I, I've just put up on the screen here um, a set of uh, cases or variations on a case, which I call two children in a play, uh, which are norms that we might have as parents for dealing with uh, problems concerning kids. The most familiar experience of my life justice is done in my life. Kids and children. Um, and so uh, you can see from these, um, without I think my going into a great deal of detail, the sorts of uh, line drawing problems that are thrown up by the distinction between corrective and restorative justice. The way I explain it in the paper is I say, well, look, the fourth norm here, uh, although we start with a, a clearly distributive problem, how to distribute two halves of a cake, the fourth norm here, number four, is at least a plausible candidate for regarding the norm of corrective justice. Uh, do we give a choice between the two sh shares to whichever child 
didn't preemptively grab and gobble up his or her preferred share of the cake yesterday. So you can imagine what's happened yesterday before you got a chance to adjudicate about who gets the sugar cake. One of them grabbed it, stuck a thumb in it, chewed off the edge of it. You know what they do? They always get the best bit. And so now you're thinking, what can we do today? And one thing you can do today is you can have a, what you might think of as a rectificatory measure. Say, well, today, since there was a bit of grabbing yesterday, we'll allow a choice to the, to the child to be made. This, by the way, gets worse if you don't give the choice. Uh, it doesn't just get worse by another 50%, it gets worse by another 500%. Uh, because you can't even remember what happened the day before yesterday. Uh, so, um, so, so thinking that four is at least eligible to be regarded as, a, as an application of a normal corrective measure, it doesn't take long for you to start working out from that into three and five, two and six, and then, well, what's the difference? <laughs> if that one's corrective, isn't the next one close to it corrective too? They're slightly different. I deliberately make them slightly different in ways that will make you doubt about where corrective justice ends and distributive justice begins. But the real aim is not for you to make a decision about that, because any decision is okay. The real aim is to make you reflect on whether there can be uh, uh, a distinction in this neighborhood strategy in philosophy. I think there are lots of categories and distinctions that shouldn't be drawn purposely. Right? This is one that should be drawn purposely. It's, it's a philosopher's distinction. It's one that's of special technical importance. I don't want to doubt its importance, but I want to suggest that we better know why we're drawing it. This one, in order to proceed. So that really is what I do in the first large section of the paper. I, I juxtapose the Holmley example So I want to now, if you don't mind, present um, uh, in 10 minutes or so the, the, the argument of the second main section. I apologize for those of you who have been so kind as to read it already, because this one I have is very dull to read. I just want to make sure that I've uh, spelled it out so that we can talk about it. So um, what I say here is that it's only when he expands on his second advertised reason for abandoning the anomaly in drawing the distinction between distributive and corrective justice problems. And hence, he begins to show us what might motivate us to draw the distinction in one place rather than another. For example, to isolate only four, or think of three, four, and five as belonging together to corrective justice. We need to know why, and this is where the work starts to be done. So most prominently, Jules emphasizes what he calls the agent relative aspect says that justice in its corrective form gives for individual agent relative reasons for acting of a kind which are not found in the distributive justice or what by now I'm calling the vanilla justice context, vanilla meaning the rest of justice. So this is the example that Jules presents. It's the example of Josephine and Ronald. Uh, if Josephine steals Ronald's radio, he says, quote, it is not as if each of us has a responsibility, if any of us does to see to it that Ronald's radio is returned, or if it's damaged it's compensated. Rather, Josephine has a reason for returning the radio that none of the rest of us has. The same might not be true with respect to at least some of our other important duties to Ronald in distributive justice. If distributive justice required that certain of Ronald's needs be met, then each of us might have the same kind of reason and justice to see to it that those needs were met. So I put the emphasis in that passage on a few hesitation words mites and perhapses and so on, which I think are of some significance in understanding what's going on. Uh, as I put it in the written version, 
is already wary about the decisiveness of the distinction that he's drawing and the correctness of his interpretation. And so he, he, he's willing to say that while all reasons of correctness So that would mean that we need to know more in terms of other criteria to distinguish among the Asian relatives that were born in Ireland on its own. Uh, but I'm going to come back to that problem in a bit. First, I want to air some worries about this first idea, the idea of Asian relativity that Jones is relying on in this part of Risks and Law. I want to ask in what sense does Josephine have a reason that none of the rest of us have? Well, you have to take a little step back and think about how this category, Asian relative reasons, was used more generally by Mark Rothko. It wasn't a designation that Jules invented. It's currently the literature, but it's not easy, and it's often used to do different jobs. And so one of the problems we have is working out which job it's doing for Jules, and maybe not the same job as anybody else's version of it, so we have to be aware of that. So, Talk of Asian relative reasons among moral philosophers, at any rate, doesn't always speak the following two ideas as separate as it should. And one is the idea that a certain reason to phi is a reason only for a certain Asian to phi. So I promise to come to your house for dinner, say Diego, um, and that reason is confronted only if I'm the one who shows up. Right? There's no reason that someone should come to dinner, there's no reason that John should come to dinner, uh, unless you invite me by mistake. Uh, assuming that the, there's no mutual mistake or anything like that, the reason given by the promise is a reason for me to be within the promise, and only me. And I, in other writing, I've called that sort of Asian relativity the property of impersonal and respective conformity. Only one person or only some persons who are eligible to conform to the reason. The reason is not conformed to if somebody else shows up at Diego's house for dinner. It has to be me or whoever he invites it. The other idea that's sometimes branded as the idea of Asian relativity is this one. It's that a certain reason to find is such that each of us should care more about our own find than we should about other people's find. All right, so I have a choice. This is the classic Bernard Williams article. <laughs> between killing somebody and allowing you to kill somebody. All right, this is Bernard Williams also altered the numbers to make it even more tense. But the basic structure is a choice between my doing this and me, my making it be the case that someone else does this. And um, any given reason not to kill, as I put it, is personal in respect to that kinship. If and only if I should choose your doing the killing over my doing the killing, even when all else is equal uh, between us. So we're both innocent and we're both feeble-minded. I mean, just whatever other conditions you want to set, uh, being age of in this sense, Now, you have to be aware that uh, these two ways in which reasons might be personal in respect of something can come apart quite radically. So, take the promise to come to Diego's house for dinner. Even though that promise is a reason that only, gives a reason that only I can conform to, it doesn't follow that my conformity with it is, should be of more concern to me than it should be to others. In fact, I might engage all sorts of people to help me get there. We might even have more reason to care about my getting there than I do. Uh, I, you know, I engage taxi drivers and uh, tell my boss I need to leave work early and I buy an airline ticket and this extends out the range of attention well beyond me. Some people whose job it might be specifically not to relieve me of the need to pretend to get there. <laughs> so I might hire a factotum whose job is to make sure I get to Jacob's house in time for dinner so I don't even have to think about it. So there can be quite radical disparities between uh, a, reason, a reason to be personal in respect of kinship and it being a reason uh, personal in respect of conformity. Um, and then there are cases the other way around. There are many reasons for not killing people that are capable of conformity by anybody and everybody. So it doesn't follow that
So we might miss as much as Ross draws in the whole of the dirty work that ends up with by somebody else rather than by ourselves. That's a common middle scenario. Um, so which way are we personal? Which of these two ways are we personal? Which are both sometimes branded as issues of activity, because Jules described these as a direct injustice. Well, the, tr the truth is, within the text around this point in the book, we get some mixed signals. Uh, it's not totally clear which kind of uh, age of relativism he has in mind. Uh, but whichever way it is, I think that there are problems. I think either of these ways of the age of relativism would be a bit of a disaster for reasons of direct injustice. So, so why not personal in respect of attention? Why shouldn't we want reasons of direct injustice personal in respect of attention? Well, because the motivation for isolating direct injustice is to be able to explain And if one thing is clear, it's that we can't understand tort law if the reasons that tort leaders have to repair or compensate or otherwise attend to the wrongs that Those are um, uh, personal in respect of attention. We've got a problem that uh, that the law hasn't got as much reason for attention on that as we do, and that seems unlikely to provide a good explanation of tort law. Because if you think of the law as another possible agent, the question arises: How much should the law care? And one thing. So on. Um, and what's more, there are others as well. It's not just the law. There's the plaintiff who has the legal power to commence the proceedings. He or she also has to have reason to care. It would better be at least as much as my reason to prepare. Uh, it might be in some way connected to a derivative of that, but that still wouldn't represent a kind of age of relativity in the personal and respective attention sense. So that's the reason to think that we couldn't want, we wouldn't want uh, correct justice to be a matter of age of relativism in the attention sense. What about from the conformity sense? Well, this is perhaps the most tricky issue still to be resolved in the literature on correct justice in tort law. It's often used as a weapon against us by our opponents, and I'm saying us here because I'm a sympathizer in a certain way to Jules' position. But the thought is that it can't really be the case, can it, that the tort pleaser has is the one who has to do the repaying, to do the repair. Otherwise, most of tort law, which is organized around tort leaders, can be done vicariously by insurance companies or by uh, employers and banks who respond to asset seizure orders and attachment of earnings orders, garnish the orders, and so on. But that wouldn't count as doing correct justice, would be damaging to the case or regarding tort law. So we're drawn into thinking that it wouldn't be a good idea for corrective justice to be understood as, as a personal matter, an agent relative matter, in either of these ways. Uh, and I think that's the uh, most uh, fearsome prospect that arises from the analysis of this <coughs> And um, uh, it's not helped by Jules's vaguer pronouncement at the end of the passage I read to you that rectification and corrective justice has to be the duty of someone in particular. All right? You might say, well, that's a third possibility. But that possibility, the other possibility is too strong. This one is too weak. All right? Uh, that would only go to show that, well, that would, that would break down the distinction between corrective justice and distributive justice in a new way, because all duties are in a way duties of someone in particular, including duties of distributive justice. I mean, it's a point that Jules himself makes in the book that when, for example, the government arrogates to itself the power to levy taxes in order to redistribute from the affluent to the less affluent, or from the powerful to the less powerful, or whatever it is that it's redistributing from and to, uh, it does so in order to uh, enforce duties that we are supposed to have, uh, each of us, to dispose of our assets in more and more. Something like that. So 
even in distributed justice, even if you like in the core cases of distributed justice, the, the cases where we think of the government as the agent of redistribution through taxation, we should think uh, of it as still being the case that uh, distributed justice are the duties of someone in particular that may nevertheless fall to be enforced or supported by others, in this case by the Indian Revenue Corps, the Internal Revenue, uh, and then by the government of Spain and Portugal. So that's a bit analogous to Now, it's odd, this leads me to think that the second reason that George gives for abandoning the Malcolm conception was not a good reason. It wasn't good to move the study of corrective justice in this particular direction, the direction of uh, uh, agent relativity, or being more personal somehow, than, uh, than the rest of justice. That isn't the correct, or I don't, I don't want to say this isn't the correct way to look at it. You can draw the distinction any way you want to look at the philosopher's distinction, but it isn't the way of drawing the distinction help us to understand what the role of corrective justice is supposed to be in understanding the law of torts. So, um, that, by the way, is helped by looking at the Indian novel again, you can think of the parent of the Indian novel as an important duty that the children have, each of the children have, and you can see that it wouldn't matter for the purposes of understanding what's going on that way, whether we classify So um, I, I spent a bit of time towards the end of the paper thinking, what might Jules have been trying to get at? You know, what was it he saw? What was it that Stephen Curry uh, introduced us to under that heading uh, that might have been uh, useful in drawing a distinction between corrective and distributive justice? And that's what I do in the very last section of the paper. Um, explain that um, the Malman conception did have features that were worth abandoning and worth retaining, but that either to retain different ones and abandon different ones. And in the process, I think, had got some handle on the idea that corrective justice is somehow more personal without So um, the suggestion I make is that the thing to be annulled in corrective justice is never just a loss or just a wrong. That those are both the, well, they're not wrong places to look, but they're shadow places to look. Uh, what's reversed in corrective justice is, uh, or annulled in corrective justice is a transaction, sometimes but not always a wrongful transaction, and sometimes but not always a loss-making transaction. And it's in understanding sense in which corrective justice is more personal and less impersonal than some other kind of justice. It's personal in the sense that it has as its ground or its occasion, if you want to use that word, uh, something, uh, some local uh, form of activity involving two people. I don't let's say two people is a bit easier, but it's tempting, isn't it, to go with language and say it's always analyzable one against the other. That's, that, that's the wider way to go. We said that the, the transactions have to, in the end, be understood as bilateral. But I don't want to sort of commit myself to that. Maybe that's true. But here I do agree with Weimar to the following extent. We should think of corrective justice in the context of transactions and as a response to them. So that's a feature which allows me to 
So there we go, that was really the, um, the story that I told, and uh, I think that will do for the purposes of exposition. Uh, yes, I think it will, because after that I'm completely blank page. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much. Okay, thank you very much. And this is done. Maybe we can change the position a little bit for this. Maybe you can turn the camera. I should show you. Oh, do you want to, well, why don't you all just come around here?
exceptionally good comments. John um, has been extremely influential on me for my thinking about this and other things for an extraordinarily long period of time and continues to be so. Uh, I'd just like to start by saying someday I hope uh, to write a book that is good enough to have gotten all the attention and uh, critical attention and appreciation that Risk and Wrong has gotten. Uh, I wish that Risk and Wrong had gotten both. <laughs> but I don't think it was, although it's a lot better than my other stuff. But um, so ac actually, um, I, I have, uh, I'd like to start in the following way. One is by saying something that's going to seem extremely immodest, but I don't mean it that way. That the dark person moves into my more modest, uh, more genuine role. That is, I, I, I started working on the philosophy of tort law in some way in 1970, when I was writing my PhD dissertation. And uh, to say I was going it alone would be an understatement. Um, so, I, I, I don't claim to have invented the field, and that's a bizarre thing to say, but um, I, I was just making it up as I went along. And uh, so until other people got seriously involved in it, I was, it was all in my head. You know, I, I was uh, playing around with ideas. I was uh, uh, trying to see what I could take from other areas of the law other areas of uh, philosophical inquiry, see what bearing it would have on the distinctive set of problems in tort law and so on. And then I've been very lucky for the vast majority of my career thereafter that a lot of other people who are very talented, many of them more talented than I am, uh, have uh, devoted their attention to the same subject. And that has had the unfortunate effect of making everything I wrote earlier mistaken. But, uh, but has uh, made the field itself uh, significantly better. <coughs> so I'm very grateful to have played that role uh, in some sense in getting it all started. And uh, I have to remind myself periodically in how many years it was when I was working on it almost entirely in my own head and trying out ideas on people who had never thought about tort law at all. And I can report that when I first went on the job market as philosophy, Less friendly, but you know, still my friends say, "Look, well, if you come to get a job in philosophy, you can always be an ambulance chaser." Uh, <laughs> and when I first went around, you have to remember, uh, kidding aside, you really have to remember that when I went on the job market, when people did philosophy of law, the main thing they did in philosophy of law was philosophy of criminal law right? and jurisprudence, and that was it. There was no no philosophy of tort law. There was no philosophy of contract law. There was political philosophy of property, but no real philosophy of property law. And one of the great things that's happened over the last period of time is the extent to which there's philosophical analysis of all these subsidiary areas of law that's really absolutely first rate. Um, and in, oddly enough, in some ways, uh, the most mature field now, other than philosophy of criminal law, would be the philosophy of tort law, uh, which has the most uh, people doing really, really interesting things. That Great, you know, it wasn't always that way. Um, so risks and wrongs, you know, so here's the way I think about my, well, we, we, must, we can start by saying, look, there are three general kinds of issues that have risks and wrongs. Uh, we can analyze risks and wrongs in some way. One is, what is corrective justice? And a whole range of subsidiary questions about what the relationship is of corrective to distributive justice, many of which, Second, what well, is what? What's tort law, right? Um, that is, what, what's how we how we sort of characterize this body of law, which is somewhat artificial. You know, that is, the boundaries between tort law and other areas of law are artificially constructed here within a natural body of law called tort law. And the third is, what's the relationship between the two? That is, uh, in what way is uh, tort law connected to corrective justice? Is it, a, is it is the right claim uh, that tort law embodies or expresses corrective justice? Is it a bright idea that it pursues 
students were aimed at, what the goal of the court was for extra justice, is the right idea that there's a certain area of the law, of course, that's a matter of corrective justice, or is all the area, is all the court law of corrective justice? And as I put it many times in my later work, an idea that obviously still needs to be explained, it's not, it's not so much that tort law aims at corrective justice, or that tort law embodies corrective justice. I've advanced a view which I hope to, to explain to you later uh, at some point during this conference, that tort law is an institution of corrective justice, which is a, a different view about what the relationship between the two may be. And that, that, that I'll be happy to explain as we go along when I have the opportunity to do so. And if, if not in response and during the conversation, I will certainly say something about it at the end. Uh, because that's a very different kind of claim about the relationship between the two. Now the thing I actually have spent the least on is what corrective justice is. Um, that is, I could give an analysis of what corrective justice is. I, I needed a working conception of it, so let me see if I can explain myself just a little bit for the rest of the discussion. And in a way, I'm taking a little time away from my directly responding to John. I thought most of his comments were absolutely, completely correct about my view, and I, I would like to say a couple of things about them when I, when I change my mind. But if I may, I'd like to say something about why I have a <coughs> lot to say about corrective justice, which means, which is not to say that I didn't have more to say about it than other people have said about it. It's just that by comparison to what I had to say about tort law, it was actually very little. So here, here is my view. I, um, I approached tort law in the following way. So I started by worrying about tort law, not worrying about corrective justice. And the question, which is none of you, probably none of you were born when I was thinking about this question, I look younger than I am, I like to think, <laughs> is, um, is this, that um, why wouldn't we do away with tort law? In, in some, some ways, I've always, that's always been my question, as why wouldn't we get rid of it? I mean, what, what is it? What, what's special about it? What does tort law do? You know, this is a question we don't typically ask about contracts. We don't say, for example, why don't we get rid of contracts? Well, I'm not sure exactly why, but I have some idea why we wouldn't. And we don't say, why wouldn't we abolish the criminal law? We can come close, because we ask the question, why wouldn't we abolish punishment in favor of something else? The punishment is a response, it's an integral part of the criminal law. We don't really ask whether we get rid of the criminal law, but we do ask, whether or not we get rid of punishment. Well, tort law is between the two because we don't only ask why we might we get rid of individual liability in torts. We sometimes say, why wouldn't we get rid of tort law altogether? That is, there's a set of problems in the world, whatever they are, and tort law is a way of responding to them. Is it a good way of responding to them? Now, it's a distinctive way of responding to them, right? So my question always has been, if we got rid of tort law, what would we be losing? That was my central question. Because I wanted to know if we reformed and eliminated tort law and had a world without tort law, what, what would we be losing? If we got a handle on that question, what would we be losing? We kind of find something out about what values uh, are central to the practice of tort law wherever we have tort law. And uh, I guess I hit upon the idea that the things that we would be losing, I could identify some of the things that we would be losing, let me mention some of them, a certain kind of emphasis on wrongdoing, not, not total and complete emphasis, but a certain kind of uh, emphasis on wrongfulness, uh, but not wrongfulness in terms of blameworthiness. That is, a, to put it crudely but not uh, necessarily accurately, Wrongfulness with regard to actions and not with regard to mental states. That is, the failure to measure up to some standard of behavior, quite apart from an individual's culpability or blameworthiness in failing to measure up. That seemed not to be a significant part of it. It was a good question to ask, well, what's our interest in failure to measure up to certain norms of behavior? Because listen, that's one thing, right? If, if we had a complete insurance mechanism, whether it was a first-person insurance mechanism or a third-person insurance mechanism, we would, it would no longer matter 
whether conduct, at least with regard to repair and losses or gains, whichever we were concerned with, would no longer ma matter whether there was wrongfulness involved, namely a failure to measure up to a certain standard of conduct, quite apart from culpability. So one thing, so that meant two things were interesting. One was norms of behavior mattered, and uh, culpability didn't. So the notion of, if there was a notion of responsibility that was involved in tort law that we were losing, that we would be losing, it would have something to do with compliance with standards of behavior and less having to do with defective character or defective motivation or the like, okay? So that meant for me that retributivism, whatever values we associate with retributivism, were not the ones were at the, that were at the core of tort law. Then there was this relational aspect of it, namely that um, the norms weren't just norms about how you should behave in general, but what you owed other people with regard to their interests. That is, how you were supposed to take their interests into account with regard to your own undertakings, as opposed to, you know, so that there was a kind of normative relationship between you, your activities, and who was put at risk by your undertakings. And that feature would be lost, or might be lost, I mean, depending on what we replace tort law with, that would be gone in tort law, right? And those were the focal points so that the norms that were the concern were concerns that had a relational aspect, right? Um, and then the, the kind of interesting thing about tort law, which I also focus on, was on one side of the equation, that the duties that arose as a result of failure to comply with these particular norms were <coughs> duties that were duties to see to it that something got done. They weren't duties for you to apologize or for you to pay out of your pocket. It was a duty to see to it that someone else's state for which you were responsible has been in some way addressed appropriately, right? And those ideas, that set of ideas, for me, were what I have tried to capture with, by the idea of corrective justice, right? So, so I agree with John that there's, I both agree and disagree with John. Um, this is not unusual, but I, <laughs> agree that the dis there's a sense in which the distinction between distributive and corrective justice is a philosopher's distinction. It's not one that, as it were, is in the world, uh, apart from philosophers thinking about it and dividing the world in a certain kind of way. But just because it's a philosopher's distinction doesn't mean that there aren't good grounds for drawing it. And it also doesn't imply, I don't think, that it, it, it should be drawn in terms of the purpose it plays in explaining some part of the institutional life that we have. Even if we have no institutional life, this might still be, even though perhaps we have a judicial agreement, there might be something valuable about seeing corrective justice differentially from distributive justice because the, these features, the emphasis on norms of behavior that are not and the norms of behavior are not themselves are central to our idea of distributive justice. What's central to our idea is that distributive justice is more closely associated with what kinds of institutions uh, form the basic structure of our society, markets, political order, and so on, the basic structure in some sense, and less about individual norms of behavior. They're also uh, not essentially uh, connected to the idea of wrongfulness in any special way. That is, the claims people have in distributive justice and the duties people have in distributive justice are not essentially connected. They're more closely connected to an idea of bad luck than they're essentially connected to an idea of wrongfulness. They're things that each of us who has duties have to do, and we create institutions to see to it that our duties are discharged by coordinators through the state, for example. But um, they're different in that we don't, for example, um, it would be odd, it seems to me, to say that we would have a 
insurance to be a distributor adjuster. And I'd say some of the kinds of insurance is required by a distributor adjuster. It would be odd to say that my particular duties as a distributor adjuster are discharged by insurance mechanisms. But my, well, I don't know. I, 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 let's just set that aside. But I mean, so I, I, I think that this feature and the idea that we're redressing or addressing or appropriately responding to the adverse consequences of our failures to comply with certain kinds of standards of behavior that involve a breach of a duty that we owe to someone else, that we failed adequately to discharge. Because the norm just wasn't behave well, don't tell lies, or something like that. It was a duty to take those people who were in the proximate reach of your conduct, whose, con whose interests are put at risk by what you're doing, um, to take their interests adequately into account. That's a failure on your part. You don't ask the question about whether it was a culpable failure on your part. You don't ask the question about whether you could have done better. You know, you were, in fact, capable. You just note the fact that you failed adequately to do it in a certain way. And that, if there's the right kind of causal relationship, the causal structure between that failure and people who were within the sphere of proximate being put at risk by your undertaking, then you've done something and you owe them something. And that idea is the idea that I'm trying, I've always tried to capture with, with, not always, not always. In risks and wrongs, I was just beginning to try to capture that idea. Prior to risks and wrongs, I was, I don't know what idea I was trying to capture. I think I was trying to capture the, a part of that idea. The part of that idea was that people who, saw, I was more concerned with gains and losses. I, let me put it this way. I had an accounting view of justice in this regard. So if people think that distributive justice, they have kind of a pattern view, uh, a la Rawls or something, you know, uh, think of this as an accountant's view in a certain way, you know, that you went up and another person went down now the question is, was this an up that was uh, permissible or was this a down that was permissible? When, and then we start to identify the permissible and impermissible ways of causing ups and downs. You succeed in business, that's an okay up. You fraud someone out of money, that's not an okay up. That's a loss, uh, that's a gain that you're not entitled to, right? So, so my idea of corrective justice was corrective meaning correct. Annul it, get rid of it, and worry about things on both sides of the equation, okay? Notice that when I thought about corrective justice before, that's all I thought about. I, to the extent to which I was concerned about how they brought it about, I, the gains and the losses and the relationships between the persons, the relationship between the persons was not as important as what, what was, the, was it a legitimate way of bringing it about or an illegitimate way of bringing it about? It was a legitimate way of bringing about, then the loss is an okay loss, and the gain is an okay gain. It doesn't matter whether they accompany one another, it's just, so it wasn't about duties that people owe to other people, okay? Now, what the, the main I insight for me in the change, which I cannot swear occurred at the time of risk and loss, because I, I can't remember that, that far back. <laughs> no, no, but in all seriousness, I was just beginning um, uh, to, to change my mind. So I don't remember exactly what my, where my mind was when it was changing, right? <laughs> because you could view the accounting view as, well, that's really like distributive justice. It's just, you know, in the sense that it's about who's got what. You know, it's, it's distributive justice in the sense of who's got what. And since I didn't really care about who rectified it, if it was a wrongful loss, it should be rectified. It was a wrongful gain. It should be rectified. If people have less than they deserve as a matter of distributive justice, they should have more. If people have more than they deserve as a matter of distributive justice, maybe they should have less and leave it at that. It didn't seem that I was really drawing a, a sufficient distinction between distributive and corrective justice in my mind, but for the fact that one was focusing on repair. That was the only distinction I really through. So when Stephen Perry brought forth the objection that 
I wasn't distinguishing between corrective and distributive justice, and he actually articulated the idea, as I recall, that, um, that corrective justice gives rise to age and relative reasons for action, and distributive justice gives rise to age and neutral reasons for action. And I, I said, well, okay, that's a way of explaining what I don't do. Right? That's, that's what I was missing. But in fact, and I think John's right to point out that that's not what's missing. Because, um, uh, and I, I saw this because I never repeated that view again, right? Yeah. I mean, I never repeat that view again. It was in those terms. Yeah. In those terms, yeah. yeah. Right, so I, that, is, that, that, was never, that never became a core part of my view. What became a core part of my view was what I just articulated. The idea that I'm looking for uh, a, a way of articulating uh, a principle of justice whose main core features are relational norms of conduct that don't emphasize culpability and shame, that uh, have to do with what duties we have to others to take their interests adequately into account, and what our failures to do so bring upon us. Right? And I thought that that was the domain. Some of them were okay. I actually really did uh, discuss the transactional view, right? I did say, I didn't emphasize the way John did that the, the core idea in corrective justice is undoing a transaction. Because John would admit that what he said so far left open what, criteria, what the criteria are for which transactions you would undo. Because, uh, because what he said was that there'd be some which were wrongful and others which were not wrongful, but you'd want to undo some and not want to undo others. And that, that's perfectly fair, it's perfectly okay to say corrective justice is the principle that says, however you figure those out, the, the, these are the ones that need to be undone, right? So corrective justice says there's some category of transactions that need to be undone. Corrective justice doesn't tell you which they are. It relies on some other principle of justice to tell you what they are. So, that, so that's perfectly permissible. I just want you to take note of the fact that by shifting to the notion of transaction, you haven't eliminated that problem, just like when you have the notion of wrongful gains and wrongful losses, you have, you have the problem of characterizing what it is that makes something wrongful, right? So, uh, and it also, it also add, invites the question about whether all transactions is a distinctive causal structure that makes something a transaction, because not everything is going to be a transaction that creates gains and losses. So you still have to answer the question, is there a distinctive kind of structure that makes something a transaction? Is it, because you could, you know, almost you could sound like an economist that, you know, a liability rule way of compensating someone after the fact when you take something from them is a forced transaction. Is it, as opposed to the way Foster's was trying to think of it, it's a wrong for which you're compensating. It's not that you have achieved the transaction of a certain sort at all. So the notion of a transaction is itself, you know, a normatively diffused notion. It's not as if, so it will have both, as it may or may not have a distinctive causal structure, and it will also be identifiable by its compliance with certain kinds of norms that are constitutive of it, that is, some of which will constitute transactions and others of which will, will not. So I, I think that in my worry about the transactional picture, I, for a while, I did hope, try to explore the idea. I, ho I hope you see, if I can just backtrack for one second, that for me, the whole of my life in this subject has really been to try to figure it out, not to have a view of it. You know, I, I mean, not, not to advance a particular view of it, it's to try to figure out what it is, what's, what's going on. And, um, you know, I, I was on the idea that maybe, well, there's distributive justice, and then there's transactional justice, you know? Uh, and then 
That, 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 that's doubly puzzling, and that correct me justice is an aspect of transactional justice because this invites the idea that perhaps that suggests that transactions are not part of distributive justice, which is puzzling as well. You know, those it was a teacher of mine, and that would be if he, you know, if he hadn't been dead already, he would have died hearing that. Right? <laughs> because for him, that's all there is to distributive justice <laughs> is transactional justice. So to say that <laughs> transactional justice is uh, the distinctive part of corrective justice, or the thing of corrective justice is then what distinguishes it from distributive justice, would be doubly. So in any event, I thought it was a terrific paper. Everything John said about my drawing distinction between uh, uh, agent relative and agent neutral reasons, I thought was absolutely right on. I, I think it's perfectly plausible and acceptable to, to say that we're, we're, we're both engaged in trying to identify what it is that's a distinctive characteristic of corrective justice. Now, my own view is the one I tried to lay out about this, these sets of different concepts that are pulled together by the idea of corrective justice. And I don't think that transaction is at the core of them. And I don't think that transaction will really enable us to distinguish distributive from correct, corrective other than by saying undoing. So that the distinctive part of corrective justice would be an undoing of something. And that may be true, that what's distinctive, it's certainly not true of distributive justice that what you're doing is undoing. Um, to the extent to which it's possible. It might be that the core idea behind uh, correction, correction is what it sounds like. It's a kind of, a distinctive kind of undoing that, that, that constitutes a rectification. What we need is the, what, what rather than unify, a variety of norms for rectification. That is, what it is that rectification is called for. That what corrective justice is, is a, is a large domain. It's a domain of undoings, called for undoings. And then the question is, there can be a set of norms in different kinds of contexts for which uh, that specify the, the conditions under which undoing is called for. And that um, corrective justice is a set of all those. That's another possible way of thinking about it. Thank you very much. Some treaties have the additional feature that they're agent relevant, which can either mean that only the duty bearer can perform the action that the party is performing against them, or that only the duty bearer should care or should care most about performing the action. Those are two different ways of interpreting uh, agent relativity, and I didn't think we'd draw the line with those additional features that were present. But I want to preserve the feature that there's somebody in particular who's the duty bearer. Um, says, the consequence of being the duty bearer is that you're the one who has to see to it that the duty is performed. And this is 
my thinking, I mean, it would be, there might be some moral objection, but it would be conceptually okay for a legal system to say, we have only one remedial system where you have two. You, British people in America, well, you have two, we have Torah, we have, and, and Torah, we have one. And the special feature of this one is that all the actions are initiated by the state, but all the remedies are without. Or conversely, that all the actions are initiated by the wrong party, but all the remedies are punitive. Either of those would be imaginable legal arrangements, and I wouldn't be conceptually challenged by them. I think that they would be intelligible. They might have some disadvantages. So that, that would be, we would just be thinking about uh, ordinary questions of advantage and disadvantage. Now the Roman, the Roman systems, I mean the imperial Roman systems, did have. an accidental feature. So it's like many other things that are arbitrary and we could have done some other way. You shouldn't confuse that. 
that was affected are good reasons for doing it this way, right? It's not like the choice is it's either unified, a conceptual, necessary truth, or it's indefensible, right? <laughs> Many things are conventional, but they're defensible conventions, and we have all sorts of good reasons for having the ones we do and not having, there are arbitrary conventions and there are non-arbitrary conventions. Yeah. Can I, by way of corroboration, could I just uh, say something that I discovered? Assimilate in a way both forms of justice, saying that the, the geometrical and analytical images of justice can be used to explain corrective justice or civil justice as well. But if you take more modern conceptions of corrective, um, of corrective justice and distributive justice, that a Rawlsian approach to distributive justice, it's not possible to see any correction as a distribution between two parties because distributive justice. Divide the benefits of social cooperation and the burdens of social cooperation, and corrective justice applies to interactions, private interactions that are independent in a way of our way of life, our social cooperation. So, if you take these two ideas of correct and distributive justice, now you can see why the Nunez conception is more like a distributive justice because it assumes that accidents as a social problem, it takes the law and economics approach, and that's why. Jules has the right intuition, maybe, in living, because it's more, uh, in a way, more um, familiar, the, the, the operation of, of the, of the, the new conception is more similar to the distributive justice, conceived that way, than to corrective justice. So that would be my, my, first, my first comment. The second comment is related to what Safi uh, said at the beginning. Um, you claim that Can explain. 
saying that the person who is liable cannot reject liability as the insurance company, for example. They can say, no, no, the, uh, this, this risk, is, risk is not covered and be out of the trial. Mm -hmm. Then they will have a contractual problem, another litigation probably. But what the defendant cannot do is to uh, reject right. the action. So he has, in that sense, he has personal reasons. In that sense, not that in a sense that he cannot make somebody else pay for him. He can do it. If, if Rockefeller comes, the should right. say, since if Rockefeller wants to pay all my debts, I'd be worried about it. Yeah. But the <laughs> Jews will be liable in the sense that he, he cannot ask or, or charge Rockefeller with his debts. In that sense, there are personal reasons in a strong sense. And my third comment is related to the second one, because once you reconstruct corrective justice in the way you do, as uh, I'm doing transactions, Allocating things back and everything, you construct you construct a model which is relational, purely relational. But you said that tort law itself is not relational because it's not personal reasons of tort, of tort law are not personal regarding conformity nor attention. So, in which sense corrective justice can explain tort law now? Because corrective justice seems to be the operation of giving things back to one specific person. Okay, so that's good. So, so beginning at the end, um, I, I didn't mean to cast any doubt on um, tort law being personal in the sense of relational, but all justice is in that sense relational. I owe money to, uh, to the poor, and it's me that owes them they that should receive it. Um, so this, in fact, was a special
Yes, no, that's true. So all I was saying. No, I tried to, in, in the paper, I tried to just be a little bit more precise than I probably was in presenting it orally. I tried to say that we, the distinctive feature of Asia Wales is understood this way as personality and perspective and conformity is that you have more reason to care about your own performances and your own, you doing the interview than other people. No, so that's the intention. Uh, you're, probably, you're, you're, you're the only one who has, you're the only one who has the, the possibility of conforming. So now, so, uh, but maybe they're not exhaustive. No, 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 exactly. That's, that's right. That, exactly. Maybe there's another yeah. kind of reason that that's it's right. personal. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. but I think Diego would make his point um, by saying that when the court gives an order that um, the way you pay is by your uh, salary being tarnished and money going from your employer directly yeah. to the court, that that reason is a reason that's parasitic shows that, uh, I mean, uh, let me put it this way, it, it's still the, the fact that I am still the duty bearer but someone else is paying on yeah. my behalf. Yeah. So that the uh, defendant uh, uh, could not just go to anyone else right. to do and say, well, I have, I, 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 I had a loss and go. Mm -hmm. So I was just- yeah. uh, and there, there are rules about that in all the mature legal systems about which um, payments to yeah. the discharges, the discharge obligation is dependent on at what point in the proceeding. Uh, there are complicated rules in English law about that. Um, so, so I, I think I think you're absolutely right. I mean, I, I meant even that to be a core thought. In another word, uh, on the same subject, I got myself into trouble by saying almost exactly what you just said. So I said, look, there's an on behalf of relationship here. Uh, insurance companies sometimes, employers, banks, and sometimes just. Who can represent who? Mm. Right? So I, I gave the definition and the law in a really excellent 
contract sold very far down. Yeah. And that, that far. So I think you're, you're, you're absolutely on to the thin ice that I'm also on. Uh, I don't know where we're going to get across the other side of that pond then. Mm -hmm. It's hard to take the parent out of it because the children are never with the dead body. But if you took the parent out of it and imagined children who were dead set on doing this properly, then on the second day, you know, in Lord of the Flies, the child can grab the sunset today, but not say, oh, for you. We can do, <laughs> he took the opportunity so that in the afternoon he re the victim received the opportunity. That's right. So I was thinking, yeah. I'm definitely thinking of opportunities as possible. Yes, yes, that's right. That's what I'm trying to make. 
you're supposed to divide it up. And the retainer will clean that one and will always take the 10 bucks and spend it straight away. Yeah? Then the next week you have 10 bucks for the other one. Uh, and no money at all for the first. And you think, well, there's a pretty straightforward tort law type transaction. And it's like, <coughs> don't have a punitive element. Uh, so it's you not. some aspects, not all aspects, of that relationship so characterized. And then it might be the case that what distributed justice becomes everything else. Or that is, I mean, it's not, it's, 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 it's just a placeholder. I mean, it's, it's a placeholder. Place so, place so the thing is, I wanted to say, yeah, it's not like there's one thing that we don't have to explain and then something else we do. That is, from a certain point of view, the thing that we thought we had to explain once it's explained, the other everything else we now need to explain why it's different. Yeah. So it, you know, this is like the my favorite part of this and wrongs, and actually one of the few articles to this day that I still really love is the the idea that in economic analysis of law you think of cooperation as a solution to failed competition, but of course you can. 